dear students today you have chosen to learn a very important lesson associated with women's health namely gestational diabetes mellitus a women's health is a total well being determined by biological reproduction nutrition and stress factors maternal health during pregnancy is of utmost importance because it influences the way in which the unborn child is programmed for future life outside the womb besides maternal health is important to ensure uneventful pregnancy and a safe motherhood among the multitude of the common complications that jeopardize maternal health during pregnancy diabetes is one of the most important the steep rise of diabetes today affects women especially young women in their reproductive age and increases the risk of pregnancy when you complete this lesson you should be able to understand what is gestational diabetes mellitus what are the risk factors and the complications involved know the diagnostic criteria for gestational diabetes mellitus and understand the importance of diet and exercise in the management of gestational diabetes mellitus so to understand this better let us start our lesson by knowing what is gestational diabetes mellitus or gdm as it is commonly known gestational diabetes mellitus is a temporary form of diabetes occurring during pregnancy and is defined as carbohydrate intolerance with first time recognition or onset during pregnancy and normal blood glucose control is usually recovered after delivery you should not get confused with those who are already diabetic these women who have diabetes before conception either type 1 or type 2 are considered to have pre gestational diabetes or called as pgdm and do not fall into the category during pregnancy let us know the past history about gdm in earlier days before the discovery of insulin diabetes during pregnancy was considered as a complication and incompatible with life and hence pregnancy was not allowed in diabetes the first reference to diabetes in pregnancy is available since 1823 and at time it was considered as a symptom of pregnancy and not as a serious disease entity in 1882 matthews duncan an obstetrician from london observed a few salient features of diabetes and focused this to the world priscilla white a pregnancy pioneer worker in the field of pregnancy diabetes and famous for her classification of gdm became the beacon of hope to many diabetic women she gave a hopeful statement that diabetes is no longer a contradiction to pregnancy she pointed out that the degree of hyperglycemia seemed to be related to pregnancy outcome and diabetes control is important for fetal welfare the first center for pregnancy diabetes the copenhagen center for pregnant diabetics was established by jorgen pedersen in 1945 dr norbert frankel played the most crucial role in establishing gdm as a definite clinical entity his center diabetes and pregnancy center conducted the prospective long term study of offspring of diabetic mothers and confirmed the hypothesis that intrauterine metabolic changes have long term harmful effects on the tissues of the offspring with that a brief history of diabetes in the past let us look into what is the reason for diabetes during pregnancy pregnancy itself is a metabolic stress test during the first half of pregnancy transfer of maternal glucose to the fetus occurs during the second half of pregnancy placental hormones outweigh glucose transfer and insulin requirements typically double the placenta functions as a nutrient sensor altering placental transport according to the maternal supply of nutrients placental transporters 
are regulated by hormones such as insulin. Gestational hormones such as human placental lactogen known as HPL interfere with insulin action and result in insulin resistance thus making it difficult to stabilize the blood sugar during pregnancy due to altered carbohydrate metabolism and an impaired insulin action. The insulin antagonism is probably due to the combined effect of human placental lactogen, estrogen, progesterone, free cortisol and degradation of the insulin by the placenta. So when should a pregnant woman take assessment for GDM risk and how is the diagnosis made? Every pregnant woman does not develop diabetes during her pregnancy but practically all the pregnant women should undergo screening for glucose intolerance. The usual screening recommendation is between 24 and 28 weeks of gestation but the recent concept is to screen for glucose intolerance in the first trimester itself or at the first prenatal visit. If found negative, the screening test is to be performed around 24 to 28 weeks and finally around 32-34 weeks. All pregnant women should be assessed for risk of GDM at the first prenatal visit. Most of the women are screened between 24 to 28 weeks of gestational. Gestational diabetes mellitus often presents with hyperglycemia and glycosuria. Selective screening at 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy is generally recommended with a glucose tolerance test and one hour assessment using either 100 gram or 75 gram of oral glucose load. Two or more of the venous plasma glucose concentrations must be met or exceeded for a positive diagnosis. Glucose tolerance test or GTT value of more than 140 milligram per dl after 2 hours with 75 gram of glucose is a definite indicator of gestational diabetes mellitus. Any one value exceeding any of these thresholds is diagnostic for GDM. The glucose tolerance test is a medical test in which glucose is given and samples of blood are taken to determine how quickly it is cleared from the blood. Usually, the oral glucose tolerance test or OGTT is performed in the morning and the patient is instructed to stay hungry for 8 to 12 hours prior to the tests. Now let us see the risk factors for GDM. Maternal age about 25 years. Women older than age 25 are more likely to develop gestational diabetes. Family history of diabetes in a first degree relative. The risk of developing gestational diabetes increases if they have pre-diabetes or a slightly elevated blood sugar that may be a precursor to type 2 diabetes or if a close family member such as a parent or sibling has type 2 diabetes. Now the third risk is glucosuria. When there are excessive sugar in the urine then it is called glucose urea and it can also lead to gestational diabetes mellitus. The next one is prior macrosomia. Fetal macrosomia has been defined in several ways. The definition includes birth weight greater than 4 or 5 kg or greater than 90% for the newborn adjusted for race, sex and gestational age. Based on these definitions, Macrosemia occurs in 1 to 10 percent of all deliveries. It may place the mother and the fetus at risk for adverse outcomes. The next one is previous unexplained stillbirth. Development of gestational diabetes occurs if the weight of the delivered baby is more than 4 kg or if stillbirth is present. Prior history of GDM or abnormal glucose tolerance. These are also likely to develop gestational diabetes if it is present during the previous pregnancies. Next is the pre-pregnancy overweight or obesity. Women who have a body mass index above 29 and or the maternal weight 
prior to pregnancy can affect the weight of the fetus. Women who are obese are more likely to have larger infants. This is also a risk factor for gestational diabetes mellitus. Now we see the history of pregnancy induced hypertension, urinary tract infections or hydraminosis. Severe pregnancy induced hypertension or PIH are associated with higher incidence of vitamin A and protein deficiency resulting in poor pregnancy outcomes. This is also a strong risk factor which leads to gestational diabetes. Knowing the risk factors, now let us switch on to understand the complications of GDM. The complications of GDM is both for the mother and as well as for the baby. Now let us first see the complications for the mother. The preterm labor. Preterm labor is difficult when a mother's blood sugar is high and this may increase her chances for risk of early labor. Developing high blood pressure. Gestational diabetes raises the risk of high blood pressure as well as preeclampsia which is a serious complication of pregnancy that causes high blood pressure and other symptoms that can threaten the lives of both the mother and the baby. The third one is developing type 2 diabetes mellitus in later stages of life. If gestational diabetes is present then it is more prone to get it again during a future pregnancy. As a woman gets older there are chances to likely to develop type 2 diabetes. However, making healthy lifestyle choices such as eating healthy foods and exercising can help to reduce the risk for future type 2 diabetes. The fourth one is birth trauma. If early diagnosis and treatment of gestational diabetes is not done, it can lead to a very large or macrosomic baby which can increase the risk of having a birth related injury such as hypoxia, brain ischemia, brachial plexus injury, herbs palsy or shoulder dystocia and cerebral palsy. The fifth one is the pregnancy induced hypertension. This condition is also called toxemia of pregnancy or pregnancy induced hypertension. This occurs in about 10 to 30 percent of women with gestational diabetes. Preeclampsia is defined as the presence of protein in the urine and high blood pressure occurring after the 20th week of pregnancy. Apart from these complications, there are other conditions which are associated with GDM. Let's see all those. The first one is macrosomia. Macrosomia literally means big body. In this condition, the baby is larger than the normal. Large bodied babies may be injured during natural delivery, so the baby has to be delivered through cesarean process. Next is hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is when the level of sugar or glucose in the blood is too low. Glucose is the main source of fuel for the brain and the body. In a newborn baby, low blood sugar can happen for many reasons. It can cause problems such as shakiness, blue tint to the skin, breathing and feeding problems. In this condition, the baby's blood glucose is too low. Breastfeeding may need to be started right away to get more glucose into the baby system. The third one is jaundice. Infant jaundice is a yellow discoloration in a newborn baby's skin and eyes. Infant jaundice occurs because the baby's blood contains an excess of bilirubin which is a yellow colored pigment in the red blood cells. Knowing the risk factors and the complications, now let us proceed to the most important part of the lesson, the management of gestational diabetes mellitus. The management of GDM involves regular blood glucose testing, medication or insulin or hypoglycemic drugs, medical nutrition therapy or diet therapy, exercise and antipartum testing. The main goal of treatment is to reduce the risk of GDM for the mother and child. Good blood glucose control can prevent fetal complications such as macrosomia 
and increase maternal quality of life. Management of GDM should be continuous and the healthcare team should have an obstetrician, diabetologist, a diabetes educator, a dietitian, nurse and a pediatrician. Clinical management can be done in three stages namely before delivery, during delivery and immediate postpartum and after delivery. The efficacy of clinical management is dependent on the food habits, a stress-free environment and other supportive care at home for the mother. Let us now know about diet management in detail. Diet therapy should be sufficient enough as a single method to control GDM and proper adoption of nutrition plans could either prevent or delay the use of insulin or lower its requirement. An adequate diet which provides all macro and micronutrients and one which encourages an appropriate weight gain is essential. All women with GDM should receive diet counseling definitely. Now let us move on to the individual nutrients. The first one is energy or calorie requirements. The expected weight gain during pregnancy is 300 to 400 grams per week and the total weight gain is 10 to 12 kg by term. Depending on the age, activity, pre-pregnancy weight and stage of pregnancy, the calorie requirement has to be met. As you see here, the ICMR guidelines is an additional recommendation of 350 calories during pregnancy above the basal requirement and this should be provided through the diet. Pregnant diabetic women are advised to distribute their intake of calories throughout the day especially during breakfast. This advice has scientific basis because the peaking of plasma glucose is high with breakfast than with lunch and dinner. GDM women have deficiency in first phase insulin secretion and to match this insulin deficiency the quantity of food at one time should be less and hence breakfast can be split into two equal halves and the portions can be consumed with a two hour gap in between. Next is carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are often the center of a healthy diet for a woman with gestational diabetes. About 55% of the total calories can be from carbs. A minimum of 175 gram with 20 to 35 gram of dietary fiber per day is advised. Consistent amount of carbohydrate should be taken in each meal and snack and inclusion of complex carbohydrates like whole grains, unrefined foods and fiber rich foods should be given. Carbohydrate controlled guidelines are important and it can be done in a way to distribute the total calories into 9 portions which is divided among 3 small meals to moderate meal and also 3 small to moderate snacks. Every time during the meal the carbohydrate content should be lessened. The type of carbohydrate also is important and complex carbs are recommended. Cereals like unpolished rice, wheat and millets like ragi, jowar etc. are advised as they are rich sources of fiber. Fiber rich foods are slowly digested which in turn causes the slow release of glucose and helps in better glycemic control. Simple carbs like sweets, fruit juices and refined products are best avoided. Snacking is common during pregnancy and the mother can be advised to take fresh vegetables and salads. Our next nutrient is protein. As you all know, Protein is very important in a day's diet and high biological value protein with low fat content should be emphasized. A 20 to 25 percent of total calories with an extra allowance of 10 gram per day of protein is recommended. As per ICMR guidelines, the protein intake is advised and good quality protein rich foods like egg, meat and fish should be consumed. Both the quality and quantity is important and fatty meat like organ meats can be avoided. During every meal time, a combination of a cereal and protein is recommended. 
Our next nutrient is fat. The intake of calories from fat is recommended to be 20%. Saturated fats like butter, ghee are to be taken in small amounts. Omega-3 fatty acids from fish is advocated because these are essential fatty acids and numerous studies have recommended fatty fish as they help in good brain performance and improve cognitive abilities in the children. Next is fiber. Fiber delays gastric emptying and glucose absorption thus lowering plasma glucose concentration. Foods rich in fiber help to maintain good glycemic control and hence whole grain cereals like whole wheat, brown rice, barley, oatmeal and legumes like germinated pulses, green leafy vegetables like spinach, lettuce etc. Salad and boiled vegetables as you see here are advised. Next is essential micronutrients. Essential micronutrients like folic acid, calcium and iron are needed for optimum maternal health and fetal care and therefore have to be given in the recommended amounts. Lack of folic acid increases the risk of neural tube and other birth defects and as you see in this chart folic acid rich foods can be given. About 35 milligram of iron per day in the form of enriched grain products, egg, green leafy vegetables, lean meat, poultry and fish is good. Vitamin B12 is important for nerve and red blood cell development and these foods are advised. Vitamin B12 deficiency may result in poor cognitive function, anemia or fatigue, mental health problems and also lead to failure to thrive. Zinc is essential for healthy immune system. Normal growth and development during pregnancy and childhood is important and therefore zinc has to be advised. Calcium is needed for skeletal growth of the fetus and is important for the mother as well and calcium rich foods like milk and milk products have to be advised. To conclude the lesson, let us see the following dietary guidelines and the tips for a GDM mother. A GDM mother should follow a healthy diet but a low carbohydrate one. High fiber food sources with fresh fruits and vegetables are the preferred carbohydrate sources. Choose at least one source of vitamin C, folic acid and a vitamin A food every day. Eat frequent small meals to reduce risk of postprandial hyperglycemia and ketosis. A diet should be low in saturated fat and total fat. Avoid sugars, simple carbohydrates, highly processed foods, dairy products, juices and most fruit juices. Limit caffeine to no more than 300 mg per day. Avoid fast foods, processed foods, high sodium foods and high sugar foods. Unless contraindicated, physical activity should be included in a pregnant women's daily regime. Regular moderate intensity physical activity like walking can help to reduce glucose levels in GDM. Knowing the diet management, now let us see how the role of exercise during pregnancy can help a GDM mother. Women who exercise before pregnancy should continue a reasonable exercise regimen during pregnancy. In fact, women who engage in prenatal exercise have been shown to have health benefits compared with non-exercising women. Moderate intensity physical exercise may also be beneficial to the women and fetus each day. A pregnant woman should strive to achieve approximately 20 to 22 minutes of aerobic activity to meet a goal of 150 minutes per week. As the body size and shape change throughout the course of pregnancy, exercise type, duration, intensity and frequency should be adjusted to promote safety for the woman and her fetus. A woman can exercise throughout pregnancy even right up to labor. But before starting on any regimen, it is necessary to take a clearance from the obstetrician. Some benefits of exercise during pregnancy include reducing backaches and constipation, bloating and swelling, improving the posture, 
promoting muscle tone, strength and endurance. Exercise helps to sleep better. Regular activity also helps keep fit during pregnancy and may improve ability to cope with labor. This will make it easier for the mother to get back to shape after the baby is born. The do's and don'ts of physical activity during pregnancy as you see in the chart can be followed. Particularly babies born before 38 weeks gestation and some breastfed babies infant jaundice usually occurs. In some cases an underlying disease may also cause jaundice. Low calcium and magnesium level in baby's blood can also be lowered. In this condition spasms in the hands or feet, twitching or crampling in the hands may occur. This condition can be treated with calcium and magnesium supplements.